It is a pleasure to introduce Toby G, who's going to give the third talk in categorical local lang langs. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so before I uh, continue thinking, I had a couple of questions uh, this morning about um, the stacks of FIGAM modules from last time. It was about FIGAM modules. Um, so I gave an example last time of, uh, so last time I gave an example of a rank one uh, FIGAM module. I saw a FIGAM module, which was not coming from a GAL representation. So we, we saw that these are not equal to um, kind of characters of GQP. Um, and kind of the justification was that you could sort of have a FIGAL module with any eigenvalue for Frobenius here, and here your, your eigenvalue had to be something you could raise to kind of arbitrary Z hat powers. Um, but of course, that obstruction doesn't exist um, if you work with the Vey group. And in fact, you can prove that these do agree with characters of the Vey group. And I should have said so. So with any coefficients. But on the other hand, this turns out to be something that's completely specific to the one-dimensional case. So I'll, we'll talk about more about the two-dimensional case again today. So this is not true uh, for rank bigger than one. Uh, so you could try and consider some kind of moduli stack of, of uh, piadic representations of the display group, but that still gives you something that's kind of strange in a slightly different way. It's a bit bigger than the modular stack of these, but it's similarly not uh, not such a nice geometric object. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, and the other thing I just want to remark of a kind of similar nature is I sort of said that um, both in Schumann's talk with sort of either talking about Baitlin representations or this kind of different definition of continuity for representations of GQP in the kind of Eladic sense, you're trying to build kind of the correct moduli space of, of Gal representations in families. Um, and for us, it's these ones with FIGA modules. But maybe it's worth saying, and I'll, I'll maybe say something slightly more about this later if I remember, that the resulting moduli spaces are very different. The things we get in this Piadic case and the things in the Eladic case, the geometry is, is very different. Um, I mean, firstly, the, the Piadic one had lots of formal algebraic directions, whereas the other, the Eladic one is, is literally algebraic. Uh, but also somehow, I mean, I'll, I'll give you some pictures later of what this, this looks like in the in this sort of two-dimensional mod P case, at least. And somehow the, the geometry is pretty uniform. You have several irreducible components, but they all kind of look pretty much the same. Uh, whereas in the Alavic case, you have quite different behavior. Um, for example, I guess irreducible representations are kind of more like just points in some sense, and you the reducible representation is sort of a, a slightly bigger families. Um, and you sort of, I guess you have infinitely many components and here we only have finitely many and, and so on. So uh, while they're kind of playing the same role, the, the geometry in the two situations is very different. Okay, so that was kind of my prequel. Um, now I want to just, I, I guess I will kind of remind you of the expected theorem and then make some remarks about it and give some examples is the, the plan for today. And maybe try and say something beyond the case of GL2QP. Uh, so this is the same theorem from last time, and I'll just briefly state it. So we always assume P is at least five. Uh, maybe I won't recall everything, but G was GL2, sorry, PGL2QP. And X is rank two call Figa modules uh, with determinant the inverse cyclic atomic character. And then the, the theorem was that there exists uh, a fully faithful I'm not going to 
sort of say exact and so on on the board, but it has various properties. It's exact, it's linear, um, which is called A from, well, let's just keep with these. I think I'll, I'll mostly be in this finally presented world for a bit. So from the finally presented uh, smooth representations of PGL2QP to um, the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on X. Let me try and keep my font constant if I possibly can. And this extended to all smooth representations for incoherent sheaves. So that was this functor, and this functor was kind of given in some sense explicitly as a tensor product. Um, so A of pi is some sheaf of G representations uh, over X, and we just take derived tensor products. Okay, so yeah, there were various properties of this that I'm not going to write out again. So this is the, the kind of expected theorem. Hopefully a theorem soon. Now, I think I said I was, I'm kind of working from some version of the notes from the IHS school last year. So I condensed it all down to 30 pages and got through six pages last time. So this morning I went through and tried to identify which bits I wanted to do and I've got it's like a choose your own adventure thing. So my instructions say turn to page 24. And then I'm going to cover three lines and then we're going backwards. So if my pages get out of order, this is going to be really bad. Okay, so last time I said I wasn't going to discuss the proof at all. Today I'm going to discuss it for like two minutes. So what's the proof? So kind of this maybe the step that we have least idea about how to do in general, like if we would we would like to have statements like this, not just for GL2QP, but for kind of general reductive groups over periodic fields. Um, but we can actually kind of construct a candidate at infinity, um, kind of in some sense explicitly, uh, via a construction of Colmez, from the, the kind of original proof of, of periodic language in its original form, so it's Comez's uh, construction. I'll just write uh, D goes to uh, D natural box P1. So I'm not going to say anything about this except to say that this is some recipe that takes a Figal module D and produces a representation of GL2QP. And if we apply this to sometimes the uh, like the universal Figal module over the stack, I mean he doesn't define it in that context, but you can uh, kind of generalize his theory to work in that sense. And then you get if you feed in some sheaf over some universal module over the stack, you get some kind of universal representation of GL2QP. So that's what we do. Um, and then kind of that's sort of step one, and then step two is kind of over sort of the generic part of the stack X. So I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you more about the geometry of this before too long, and I'll explain what I mean. But this is some, some kind of dense open substack. Um, we can compute uh, the functor A, again, in some sense explicitly. We can make an, enough uh, deductions about it to to show it's fully faithful when restricted to this. When it's when in, well, it's fully faithful when restricted to some kind of subcategory of some corresponding subcategory of of pies. Uh, and then. Uh, the kind of non-generic part, turns out I've deleted some kind of nasty um, representations that are harder to deal with. But I'll also say later how this 
kind of relates, I'll say a little more about how this relates to the work of uh, Colmez and Pashunas. And then what we do is we kind of glue in this kind of older Pierre Langrens sort of informal neighborhoods of some points uh, to this thing on, on the generic part. So we sort of glue uh, Pascunus in. I feel like I should say something more amusing than that, but maybe that's amusing enough. Okay, and this, this is some kind of analog of, of Beauville Laszlo gluing. I mean, maybe it's literally that on the, the spectral side and it's some kind of analog of it on the rep theory side. Is is you? No. <laughs> no, I understand Pascunus very well. It's uh it's maybe this part that still has to be finished. Sorry, where does the um well in in some it's maybe because you're lazy. I mean or because Colme oh, no, I shouldn't say this, but like if you go back to Colmez's original proof, he also has P at least five. And um, well, firstly, that having his big paper and being able to actually kind of work through it and just use that as a reference was pretty helpful for me in trying to to not try and simultaneously extend to p equals two and three. But I'm not completely sure that I mean, Piedic Langlands is a theorem for p equals two and three, but the proof is not the same as Commerce's original proof. And I think we might kind of in the end, use something, use some statements which should also be true in PS two and three, but maybe have been kind of circumvented in the Comes Dospinescu Pesunus stuff. So that's kind of one reason. Um, another reason is that the geometry of the of the stack is a, is a bit worse when PS two and three because uh, I mean basically because the mod p cyclotomic character is either quadratic or trivial, and so I mean somehow the generic part of this the is maybe literally empty when p equals two as we define it. So that would be slightly annoying. I mean, you have this kind of issue that the, the kind of the, the, the kind of components, I and mean, I'll come back to this, but the kind of components you might worry about are sort of components where you have sort of extensions like this or components that look like extensions like this or that look like extensions like this. And you kind of deal with these things separately, but in the p equals three case, these kind of cases have merged and in the p equals two case, they've all merged. So it's a future PhD problem, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe. But yeah, like kind of life is short and, you know, we want to finish a paper at some point. But yeah, I, I mean, the theorem is surely true for P and 2 and 3, but I'm, it's not going to be so easy. Uh, for the generic participation, do you need to do it just mod P or P Um Yeah, I mean, every, everything is mod... Uh, and sometimes you, we have to do everything mod powers of p, but it's probably no, not really any harder to do to do that than to do it mod p. Yeah, somehow the the periodic direction for these things is not so bad. Any other questions about the proof? Okay, so now I have to go back, and I think we will get to the examples, but I want to just make um, some other remarks about. Kind of the theorem and how it relates to other things. So the first remark is about um, an old paper of, I should probably have looked up the authors of this paper, but let me see if I can get this right. Uh, Hariani, uh, Emerton, and the alphabetical order right, me, uh, David Geraghty, Vitas again, and Sugrushin. Hopefully that's six people. So, um, so we did this construction, and then and Peter kind of did this better. Um, at least if uh, P uh, is a prime not dividing two D, uh, we kind of found a construction. The associated to uh, we we yeah let me get this right so we take some row bar that's maybe even just a representation of some piadic field f uh, that's d-dimensional and then we constructed in some very non-canonical way using 
uh, the, the Taylor Wiles method that we're seeing in Patrick and James's uh, course this week, uh, we constructed uh, an, what I'll just say it's an R infinity module, um, N infinity. with an action of GLD F. So what is R infinity? R infinity uh, is some power series ring over a local Galois deformation ring, but we can interpret this in this kind of language that I've got over there in the following way. Uh, we have a stack XD, which is just going to appear for this remark and get, disappear again later, but some some version of what I'm doing here. This was just a stack of uh, tall P gamma modules. Um, of rank D. And now for the field F instead of just for the field QP. So this thing also exists and it has similar properties to the to stack X. Uh, then this row bar is exactly corresponding to some point uh, some FP bar point of the stack XD. And then R infinity is just a versal ring by some morphism F to XD. And then what should this M infinity be? Well, the conjecture is uh, there exists kind of uh, an L infinity. Maybe I should make some notation to make it different. D F, uh, sort of, as in the expected theorem. So there should be some version of the expected theorem for this d-dimensional case, and then the L infinity that we were previously thinking was a candidate for Pierre Langlands should just be the pullback of this L infinity. Sorry for this terrible notation I'm just making up. So there was this, in some way, there was some kind of earlier candidate construction of a, some kind of pielic Langlands by some very non-canonical process. But the idea is that actually what that earlier construction was doing was just kind of witnessing this expected version over the stack just at, at formal completions. Um, so M infinity, uh, comes from uh, Taylor Wiles patching uh, the completed cohomology of Shimura varieties, unitary Shimura varieties. And we know a lot about completed cohomology of Shimura varieties and quite a lot about the Taylor Wiles method. And what this means is that if you believe this conjecture, um, then you should be able to uh, kind of deduce, and, and you want to understand this about this L infinity, you can kind of make deductions about what it should be by things you know about M infinity. So this is, you can kind of use M infinity to help understand uh, what I'm just going to stop writing this stupid made up notation so what L infinity is so it's not like it it gives you some way to make a construction like we can't use anything about Taylor Wiles patching to kind of make this kind of construction in the end it at best you can kind of make deductions about what this thing should be after you take formal completions at points but several of the properties that this L infinity had in the theorem that I didn't write up this time, like its, its flatness over the Iwasara algebra and the fact that it's actually a sheaf rather than a complex of sheaves and so on, uh, those are all things that would have to be true if this expectation was true. So in fact, that's how the kind of conjecture was originally arrived at. And that's how when I say something about GL2QP squared and expected properties and so on, that's very much motivated by this. Another thing I'm not going to say at all is that there's, I mean, in uh, Jinwen's paper on coherent sheaves on stacks of L parameters, he has global versions of all these conjectures. 
And really, the kind of way to think about this is, in fact, uh, this M infinity was got by sort of going from some global to local situation, sort of patching together global things. But really, the point should be that the computed cohomology of Shimura varieties is kind of computed by L infinity and by the analogous things for L not P that Shimon's talked about. Okay, so that was one remark. Um, kind of another remark related to this is um, as well as doing completed cohomology of Shimura varieties, more traditionally you just do cohomology of Shimura varieties at finite level. And those give you nice finite dimensional spaces. And how do they relate to this functor? Well, maybe I can just do a sort of mod p example. So if v is maybe literally a smooth uh, finite dimensional Uh, FP, the result algebra over K over FP uh, module. So literally just a finite dimensional FP vector space with an action of, of K that factors through some finite index subgroup. So like the trivial representation. Um, well, then the sheaf uh, A of the compact induction of V, uh, well, this is by definition what I get from doing L infinity tensor over OG with this compact induction. But this is just the same as doing L infinity tensor over the OSR algebra of K with V and why am I still muttering about Shimura varieties? Well, this is the analog. If I replace this L infinity with N infinity, uh, this kind of thing is just computing spaces of, uh, I guess, modular forms uh, with coefficients in V. But in any case, the, the flatness of L infinity over here means that this is just going to be an actual sheaf again. So this is concentrated in degree zero. So it's an actual sheaf. So whenever you put in compact inductions of anything, which is something I'm going to be doing a whole bunch today, you just expect to get actual sheaves out in the same way that kind of spaces of modular forms are just spaces and not having cohomology in lots of degrees. If you're looking, uh, at least if you're avoiding kind of Eisenstein ideals, which I'm going to. So again, this is some kind of thing that, at least in my head, as you can tell, is coming from sort of Shimura varieties, but this is some very general property, um, which we expect in all these contexts and definitely holds in the actual context of GL2. And similarly, I did a kind of an FP version, but you can put in any sort of locally algebraic type and work over ZP as long as you get it complete everywhere, which I'm not going to do today. Today, I'll just stick mod P. So, so yeah, these, are, these combat inductions, as I kind of said a bit last time, and we'll say more today, are also sort of building blocks. So evaluating the function on these things is going to be a good way of understanding some, some things about it. Um, and yeah, this is, this, is, this is part of, I mean, this, this is kind of not so hard from this construction. Yep. If we're in GL2QP, yeah, sorry, there's going to be some kind of shift of uh, shift of realities, probably, in things I'm saying. So always, for GL2QP, this thing exists, and it's a theorem. Also for GL1. Conjecturally, it exists in general. Pretty sure that conjecture is going to be true, but we, it's not proved in any other case. So I'm going to try and make remarks that are kind of should be true in general and, that, and are proved to be true in this case. So what is this an example of? Uh, well, it's kind of a statement at the moment, but the, the kind of in the optic above, it's supposed to be sort of just saying that when you kind of take, so 
I think, it, I mean, this Taylor Wiles patching, you typically work in situations where cohomology is in a single degree, like modular curves, you kind of avoid um, looking at the, the kind of gal representation one plus cyclotomic or something. And in that situation, this kind of Shimura variety analog is that um, this kind of thing here would just be literally computing spaces of modular forms with kind of coefficients in V. So taking uh, cohomology with coefficients in the corresponding local system. But this is not a help. I mean, I'm basically going to say a, a whole bunch of disjoint things for 90 minutes. Well, only another hour now. And, and hopefully some of them will be of some interest to some people and possibly some of them to know people. But I guess rest assured that if I'm not saying something helpful, then I'll at least be saying something different five minutes later than Yeah, okay. So I mean L infinity is no, N. N infinity. N infinity would, would appear if I just pulled back to, to here. So if I do that, yeah, if I if I kind of F up a star everywhere, then I get this kind of older picture and then I get cohomology of modular curves. So it's probably very unhelpful to put this directly underneath here and try and relate them, but yeah, you could completely ignore this, maybe. Yeah, so so this is this is the point. This L infinity, as I probably I probably should have just written out the whole theorem, but L infinity is flat over this. And so this is a deduction. Yeah. On the other hand, if you if you want this property that we kind of believe happens, that kind of basically pretty much forces L infinity to be flat over here. So the two things are very closely related. Um, kind of, there, there exists a, a compatibility. With duality that I'm not really going to discuss at all. But it's also kind of helpful to know about. Um, so on the kind of smooth representation side, uh, you compose the kind of duality that you get by taking Arhom's to Uh, to the over the completed group ring to itself, uh, you compose that with kind of the involution G maps to G inverse transpose. And on X, you just take uh, Grotten D their duality. And then Again, I guess, kind of expected theorem. Uh, maybe I should have uh, put in a shift here. Sorry, like maybe I need to shift by four, shift by the dimension. Uh, so these are intertwined. By, uh, by the functor A. And again, some statement like this should be true in general. But for example, this implies that, um, for example, if V is actually an uh, irreducible uh, FP, say, representation of uh, PGL2 FP, which is a quotient of K. So then I can apply the construction over there. I can think about what happens to the compact induction. And we know it's supposed to be something concentrated in degree zero. And if you think about what this duality does, if you do a, a little thinking about the duality on, on this side, uh, you conclude that, uh, let me just actually swap at this point. Sorry, two seconds. I think I want four because that's what it says on my page. Uh, could be three. 
<laughs> I've definitely got this wrong at times in my life. So, uh, but I think four. Um, this implies that uh, when we evaluate on this compact induction, that this is self dual. Okay, so that's that's something that comes out of this. So what I'm kind of aiming towards here is, um, maybe I should say, the irreducible representations are often of the finite group are often known as stair weights. And if you think about it, this I mean this functor is compatible with colimits, and so uh, the whole category is actually built out of these compact inductions of irreducible representations and characteristic P. So somehow, sorry, B is always self-dual for, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's various ways of, I mean, you either have to, you, there's, I mean, I think this statement is correct and it's correct in general, but you have, there are also some options that you, have an involution on the Galois side as well. You have to have some duality somewhere to get things right, but yeah, it's not not a problem here. Um, right, so these are sort of building blocks that I want to kind of describe, and one property they're gonna have is they're gonna be self-dual. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if I apply one, du apply the duality on the, on the rep theory side and then A, that's the same as applying A and then doing the duality on the other side. No, no, no. Just literally just saying there's a kind of commutative diagram of, of functors. I think you're like some pages ahead of me. It's more like the deduction will be the other way around. But, but yes, I mean, it depends what order you're putting the facts in. But yes, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, so where, where we're heading in, on, in the examples is I want to tell you what, the, what these sheaves are. And one clue is, is this self-duality. And another clue is if you go back to this kind of slightly dangerous board where I'm going to confuse people, but... In this case, you really know something about what happens when you when you pull these sheaves back to modular curves or something. So you know you're going to deduce from this that it actually has to be some line bundle somewhere, and so then it's going to be some self dual line bundle somewhere, and then you'll know what it is. Yeah, maybe. If you're the probably non-existent person who knows a lot about periodic Langlands for GL2QP and hasn't seen me talk about this before, the other the kind of nice thing is that this duality is coming from this um, short exact sequence of Comes where this denatural box P1 lives inside D box P1, uh, maps to the quotient, and there's a duality between the sub and the quotient, and that's what's going on here. I'm not going to say anything more about that though. Okay. Um, Great, so now we get to go to page six. Actually, I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna write this down, but I can actually say to, in answer to Vincent's question again. So actually, for me, the motivation for this line bundle statement comes from, like, as I said, about modular curves and so on, but you can actually deduce it now, deduce something from uh, the kind of formal properties, because if you use something I'll come to in a bit that you use, you know what the endomorphism algebra of this is, and then you think about the functor being fully faithful, and then you combine that with the self-duality, which gives you some Cohen macaulay property, then you can actually kind of do the thing you wanted to do. Okay, but let's not do that. Great, okay, so now I'm supposed to be here, and I'm going to go... Great, I have stair weights on the board. So let me make stair weights explicit. So what are they? Uh, so V equals uh, 
of their weight um, kind of implies that in fact we can write v equals sigma a comma b in some notation that does appear quite a bit in the literature, I think, which is the representation det a tensor sim b of fp squared, where because I've got always PGL2, we have to insist that 2a plus b is congruent to zero mod p minus one. And because I want this to be irreducible, uh, b is between zero and p minus one. And so these, I mean, up to you know, a um, only being defined mod p minus one, these give you exactly the irreducible representations of PGL2 FP. And because I've taken this decision to work with um, only trivial central character, we also see that, and because p is odd, b is actually going to be even. So there are some interesting things that happen when b is p minus two, but we're not going to see those at all today. Okay, so uh, let me push that one up a bit. So I think I said last time that the the stack X, its irreducible components are labeled in some way um, by stair weights. And so there's going to be some labeling um, of irreducible components in terms of these. So let me just uh, give you kind of a definition. We say that sigma AB is generic if we've avoided the case um, of B being actually equal to P minus one, and it's very generic if, uh, if it's also not equal to zero. So these cases are going to be a bit different. I will try and say something about them because they kind of relate to things that Shimon said in his first lecture. But I'll probably mostly concentrate on the very generic case where the behavior is going to be pretty much uniform. OK, so then now you kind of have a proposition. Um, so there exists uh, an irreducible component uh, x sigma of the underlying reduced stack of x for each uh, generic uh, say weight sigma. I'm going to start calling them sigma rather than v now. Um, and two components And of x sigma plus minus if sigma is kind of sigma a p minus one. So with my normalizations, there's two choices of a here. It could be zero or p minus one over two mod p minus one. So that's why I'm being slightly pedantic there. So you get one component for each set weight, except you get two for these kind of so-called Steinberg weights, and kind of these exhaust. Uh, the irreducible components but furthermore we can kind of describe these in a completely explicit way so let me uh, let me yeah i should probably move over If 2a plus b is 0 mod p minus 1. I mean, that's just, if you think about what this representation is and how the, this this has an action of GL2fp, and this is just the condition that the torus acts trivially, the diagonal matrix is act trivially, because they act by kind of a to the, the, yeah, lambda to the b and then lambda to the 2a here or something. This condition is what you need for this to be an irreducible representation. So this this is a, if I didn't have this second condition here, I would be enumerating the irreducible mod p representations of GL two FP. They're all absolutely irreducible, and this is just the ones which have trivial central character. Okay, uh, I don't think I'm going to swap these. I'm just going to be getting rid of everything. So, so right. Let me give you the explicit description of these. So 
Sorry? Well, I haven't finished stating it because I've been clearing a board to continue stating the proposition. But I think already I've told you exactly how many irreducible components there are, and that's surely not something you would know just from the definition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me if you let me finish the, the statement, then <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the sigma is generic. Um there exists an isomorphism. Um between x of sigma and it's a quotient so it's i take a2 minus the origin and i mod out by uh, a gm so this is all happening over my residue field but maybe i'm just going to pretend my residue field is over fp and so the what's the gm action so gm acts as let's get the same notation so an element u in gm acts on a pair t comma x by acting trivially on the first variable and by kind of weight two on the second but i can now be this is still not a very precise statement but i i can now tell you at least uh exactly what all the fp bar points correspond to so if you remember this, this theorem of Fontaine says that while we're doing these Fugan modules uh, in families, if we just take points over a, a field, a finite field, or FP bar, we get actual Gauss representations. So uh, the locus um, t equals zero is, uh, well, if you put t equals zero and then look at what's going on here, because we're scaling here, we don't get so many things, we just get irreducible points. So this is the irreducible locus. So where the Gauss representation is actually a two-dimensional irreducible representation. And the locus uh, x equals zero is the uh, split locus. So where you're a sum of two characters and in general, uh, I can be more precise. Uh, the locus where t is not zero is just giving the universal extension of characters of the following form. So let's see. Kind of lambda sub t. I think this is not the notation I had last time, but never mind. Um, omega a plus b star zero uh, lambda t inverse omega to the a. Where here, what does this? What's the notation? Lambda t is unramified and takes Frobenius to t, and omega is the mod p. Six atomic character, it's some other notation for epsilon bar. Okay, so, so this is something that can be proved. Uh, the with the hypothesis we've got this hypothesis bit of being generic. It's true that these x are a one-dimensional, um uh, at least away from the um the kind of case of, of B being zero when you get finite flat extensions, which I'm not going to say. Uh, and the proof of, of this part is just, this is kind of more or less an exercise using fontaine Phi theory to, to show that, so one kind of direction here. So using fontaine Phi theory, what you can do is you can construct an embedding of this into the stack X. You can write down some family of Figan modules and then see that it has these properties and then the claim is this is actually giving you an irreducible component which is not so obvious you get, am i getting the wrong determinant 
You're right. This should be A minus one. Thank you. I was also a bit confused by the ratio of the characters. So, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so these should, in fact, also, I'm not going to talk about like the weight part of Sayers conjecture or anything today, but the other interpretation of this component is all of the points you're getting are exactly the ones to which uh, sigma is an attached Sayer weight. And that means that these are all the ones which occur as the reductions of crystalline representations uh, with some hodgetate weights that I've hopefully written down. I guess it's one minus A and minus A plus B with these slightly curious conventions. If you have the convention that the, the cyclotomic character has hodgetate weight minus one. Um, I forgot which boards I'm working on. So that's the generic component. And now I should tell you about the non-generic component. And then we'll have finally finish the proposition and we can see how much content it has. Um, this one in some sense is even easier because the, the non-generic one or non-generic ones don't contain any irreducible representations. So they look pretty much like the thing there. Let me just tell you what happens. Okay. And if, uh, if sigma is sigma a p minus one, uh, then this time you just get an a two mod gm isomorphic to, and well now I have two components. I said this plus minus one, and this time the action, I'm maybe going to call my variables x and y. And this is, they're both having weight two. And on points, the corresponding representation is just an extension. I guess I got this unramified character where these plus minus ones are the same, are the same ones as in the components. So either they're both one or both minus one. And I've got an omega to the minus a. Sorry, I should move this over. Uh, I've got an extension class, and I've got uh, so permanent right minus a plus one. And x and y are parameterizing the extension class, which is now a, it's now a, a, a two-dimensional x group. So these correspond to the extension class. So if you like, I mean, these, these don't have a canonical meaning, but one of them you can be the Peremophier locus, and then the other one is kind of define modulo that. So again, you can kind of, it's, a, it's an exercise, maybe a slightly more difficult exercise, um, but at least probably it's kind of morally easy to see that you should have some, some map like this. And again, the claim is that this is an irreducible component. Uh, these are, in fact, all the things that have this thing is a sayer weight, if you know about that. And this gives us, gives us all the irreducible components. So now I've finished the proposition, and now you're allowed to talk. Well, no, the, the, the point is, I did verbally say such a thing, and I said it wrongly. Yes. So th the point is that you're pointing out a mistake in what I said, which is the mistake I always make, which is it's not the, the statement is true that you see exactly the things of that say weight, except in the case of the sigma p minus one where to see all the things with that with that say weight, you have to take this and the corresponding component, sigma a zero. So this is this mistake I always managed to make when giving these talks. I made the same mistake here about three and a half years ago. Um, and you can find it on YouTube, no doubt. But the, the point is that the, if you like, the Bronner-Mazar cycles are exactly these components, except for the Steinberg weights, where it's the component plus the sim zero. Thanks. 
Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, I'll come to that next. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, well, so, so I mean, this, this, this thing here at the top does include the irreducible representations, because here this locus is where t is not zero. Um, but this is not, this is an important point, this is not really a family of representations. Point-wise, this makes sense. And if I fix the value of t, then I do have a family of Gower representations. But in fact, if I allow t to vary, there is no universal Gower representation like this. And there's not even a universal Bay group representation. So this is, yeah, this is an important point. This is kind of the, the first example of something where you have a family of Figan modules. And if you look at it, it looks like there's a reasonable family of, of Gower representations. But if you try and make that family, what you find is that as you vary t, this, this eigenvalue of Frobenius, um, if you keep it in any finite field, then it's okay. You can make families of vague group representations. But as you make uh, T la lie in larger and larger finite fields, the uh, class, the, the extension being cut out by this extension becomes more and more ramified. So in fact, there is no uh, universal family of Gale representations or even vague group representations like this. So this kind of looks like a family, but it's, it's actually something that, that's only true point-wise. Yeah, thanks. Uh, whereas here, there is actually some kind of family because the, sem the semi-simplification is constant. But yeah, for these ones, there's no real family unless I sort of fix the T. And so you can't, you also just literally can't see actual families of Gower representations where you see the irreducible things because uh, if you have a family of reducible things that are representations of a group, they have to stay reducible when no, no matter how you take limits. Um, so this is another way of seeing that you can't have a possibly have a family of group representations that has this behavior. But in fact, already on this kind of ordinary locus, you, you already don't have that. Okay, maybe I should just actually just draw a picture very, just so I draw, do draw one picture, which is just the picture of this component up there. Um, I could mess around with colored chalk, but I won't. So here's A2 with the origin punctured. Uh, here's the the kind of split locus. So this is the, which is the locus where x equals zero. And then vertically, this is the kind of irreducible locus where p equals zero. And then there's this, this action of this GM on the whole picture. And again, you can kind of see if you, if you stare at that family and think about its uh, automorphisms and how conjugation by a torus by like sort of the matrix U, U inverse goes, you can see why T is being unchanged and X is being scaled by weight two. So that's kind of what this picture is showing. And now the point is, so I've now told you about irreducible components, but this is not the same as telling you about connected components. So I've told you some of the geometry. So now I'm not going to spend uh, much time saying how these things glue together, but we now know at least, for example, if you think about the split representations in this family, so these are the, the representations that look like that are of the form sort of lambda t omega a plus b direct sum lambda t inverse omega a minus one. Uh, that occurs on on this component. But if I just swap the order of the two characters, you can see it's also occurring on some other component. There's some companion weight, um, which uh, this is also, if I swap, you see that this is also on the component X of, hopefully I've written this down, sigma, uh, it's A plus B plus one and uh, P minus three minus B. So just if you just do the exercise of swapping these two things and kind of finding a, an A and a B that, that give the corresponding characters, an A prime and a B prime, do you get this? And so that gives you another component, which is glued to this one exactly along the split locus. 
But the other slightly subtle thing is if you notice what you've done, when you swap the, the role of these two things, you swap T and T inverse. So there's kind of another component. Um, and if there's another component, Uh, is glued here uh, via E in exchange with T inverse. Okay, so we, we glue two components together along the split locus, and the gluing swaps T and T inverse. And similarly, I'm not going to talk about it at all, but there's also for each component, there's a, a component glued along the irreducible locus, again with some kind of, of shift. So, so the geometry is uh, is not so bad, but kind of combinatorially, you're you're gluing, gluing together kind of a chain of components. So maybe let me tell you one more thing about. That. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm not I'm not going to get to that that point, but let me so let me make some remark now. So, if we take the locus, for example, um, this kind of ordinary locus where I take a component and delete t, the, the irreducible point, then the whole thing is the, 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 that gives me some open in the underlying reduced and so some open in the whole stack. And that whole thing is just formally smooth over this, this reduced part. Um, there are points where the whole, where the, where the there can be points which are smooth in the underlying reduced, but they're not smooth in the whole stack. The, the kind of generic part of the stack that I talked about earlier is literally what I get by deleting the irreducible locus on the components and then looking what happens in the whole stack. And you can do some deformation theory to see that really it's just what you get is formally smooth over, over the locus where I delete this. Uh, so for P being at least five, I think it's just going to be, and Vitas will probably immediately correct me, it's the things which are twists of extensions uh, like like this, I think should be the, the things that you want to worry about. Uh, I think we're asking about which, which are the points where the unrestricted deformation ring fails to be formally smooth. We're asking about smoothness of the whole stack. So is this is this the correct answer? Like up to twist? It's these things which are bad. P is at least five. Yeah. And you can see that this is kind of going to be worse when P is three, for example, there are irreducible points and also this is any other questions? Yeah, I'm getting closer to my goal of telling you some actual examples of sheaves, um, but let me maybe tell you one more thing about the geometry before I do so. so I, I can tell you one more thing, which is, is not quite as easy to prove. You need a bit more than Fontaine de Fye's theory which is you can explicitly say in the underlying reduced what happens when you glue together uh, these two components along the, along the split locus. So maybe I should give this name some, some name, this, this kind of thing I'm going to call sigma co for, for companion. So for the kind of components x, Sigma x sigma co uh, are glued along the split locus or along the split loci. And if uh, if they're both uh, very generic, so I want to avoid this having anything to do with the sort of sim zero or sim p minus one, then, then the union, sorry, I'm doing my thing of losing track of my pages, but 
Uh, union has an explicit description somewhere here. Great. So X, X, sigma union X, sigma K is isomorphic to, I need some more chalk to write this. Uh, there's a P1 with a variable T cross uh, with a product of two lines. About my residue field is should have been K when I was being lazy earlier and calling it FP. So this is mod XY. Uh, this is all mod a GM. Maybe there's no action on the T, so let's GM here. And the GM variable is U, with U acting on XY via weight 2 and weight minus 2. U squared X, U minus 2Y. Uh, and now, sorry, this is probably not very helpful if you're taking notes. Now I just have to delete a couple of things. So I delete um, the zero locus in T crossed with kind of the X equals zero locus. And I also delete the point of infinity uh, times the y equals zero locus. OK, so these correspond to the two components. So if I take the locus where y equals zero, I get something that's like that component over there, and similarly with x equals zero. And I'm telling you that they're glued together in this way. And this P1 is happening because I was gluing T on one component to T inverse on the other. Okay, so, and again, if I if I delete the, the points zero and infinity, which are the points that correspond to irreducible representations, then the whole stack is, the, the corresponding part of the whole stack is formally smooth over this uh, in some kind of way. I guess you, I should be slightly careful what you do is these, these variables X and Y, um, kind of lift and you have to you pass to the x y addict completion is what's happening okay but let me not say anything more about that but let me just remark that this thing in particular has a map to a p1 and what is this map uh, this map is um, given by sending a representation row bar to its semi-simplification. So the point is, it's just recording this T, and the data of T up there uh, kind of knows what the, the semi-simple representation is, what happens when star equals zero, but you've lost the extension class. And so this is telling you what kind of this is giving some kind of um, like sort of coarse moduli space type map for these two components. And in fact, you can check that you can then glue these things together at the irreducible point. So you're gluing together P1s at zero and infinity, and you end up with some chain of P1s, which is, you can think of as some kind of moduli space of semi-simple representations. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to say anything about that, but it's um, it's kind of an important part of the picture. And it's a part that really only works for GL2QP. So it's a very nice thing. But if I try and do, as I, as I will try and say something like GL2QP squared, there's no picture like this at all. There's no interesting maps to schemes. You can only map to points, basically. OK, so maybe I'm going to verbally make one more remark that will be of interest to at least two people in the audience, which is, I can then think about maybe what happens if I fix T down here. Um, does that have any meaning? Like does kind of fixing to semi-simple uh, mod P, fixing a sort of semi-simple mod P representation have some meaning? And this has a lot of meaning in particularly in Vitas's work on Pielic Langlands because associated to semi-simple row bar is the pseudo deformation ring. Which if you've seen what he does, he kind of parameterizes um, kind of, uh, admissible representations, perhaps, in terms of modules over, over pseudo-deformation rings. And 
from the point of view of, of what we're doing, and I said we're going to kind of glue his picture in, what that means is if you fix a point down here, so you're fixing a semi-simple re representation, and consider what would kind of happen if you restrict our functor, you can restrict it to the kind of, there's a, a block of associated representations in his work on the uh, on the representation theory side. And on the Gower theory side, you can kind of restrict the stack all the way down to an actual stack of Gower representations that was defined by Carl Wang Erickson. And you can ask if there's then a functor between these two things, if our functor restricts, and it does. And this is basically a, a kind of reinterpretation of, of what Vitas did. Literally, the functor is given by taking a representation, applying Kolmes's functor V, and then tensoring up to the universal Gower representation, and then deriving that functor. I'm not going to write this. I can talk about it later. Um, and this is related to some work of um, Christian Johansson and James Newton and Carl Wang Erickson, who have some similar functor, which I think exactly differs from the functor I just described by said duality. But again, let me not say anything more about that. Okay, so finally, we're in a position to, I think, actually say where some sheaves are going, although we've kind of said it a few times in some sense. So let me let me keep um, the top board and erase the, the lower board here because I don't want to talk about the, the non-generic component Okay, so, so another kind of, maybe a lemma if you like at this point, is that you can say exactly where the compact induction of one of these stair weights goes. So let me assume sigma generic. I'm not going to talk about the non-generic case, but I, it's in the notes. Uh, this is the unique uh, self-dual line bundle on uh, the component X of sigma. So it's supported on the underlying reduced. It's in fact supported exactly on this component. It's a line bundle. So I mean, if you look at what this component is, it's an A2 minus the origin, which has trivial Picard group. There's no line bundles there, no interesting line bundles. But there's this GM action. So there's kind of a Z's worth of line bundles. And then uh, depending on your sign conventions, it's the one that corresponds to sort of minus one in the Picard group, or maybe plus one if you normalize things differently. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, an O of minus one thing. So as I said, there's kind of several ways to, to deduce this. Once you, so, so why should this be true? Again, doing a slightly dangerous thing of going back to um, thinking about modular forms. I could be thinking about mod P modular forms of some weight. The associated Gower, the Gower representations corresponding to those are the ones which are Fontaine Le Fay of the corresponding cogitate weights. That's something we know. So it sort of should be supported on this x of sigma. And you also know perhaps some kind of mod p multiplicity one theorems for modular forms. You know that they typically are going to be one dimensional. And so that would tell you it's a line bundle. But the other way to do it is that which is kind of maybe more in the spirit of the things you've been I've been saying is as I kind of mentioned earlier, you can kind of compute endomorphisms and use duality to deduce that you have some Cohen Macaulay sheaf and then kind of from the fact that this is uh, this is smooth, deduce that it's actually a, a, a vector bundle and then deduce it's a line bundle by thinking about the endomorphisms. So there's kind of lots of ways to see this should be true. And of course, when proving the theorem, the other way is that we we do have a natural description of the functor and you can, in principle, compute what happens. Okay, so that tells us about these things. Um, now, Exactly. So it comes from pullback from the flag variety as well. Perhaps links to the previous 
this is this is true always for Fontana Fi things, I think, but not not some completely general statement. Uh, yeah, I guess in this case. And in fact, this is like the only case where we have a course moduli space. So <laughs> it's kind of not true in any other case, but yeah. Yeah, so th these line bundles are literally pulled back from, from flag varieties. And as I said, there is probably some, in the end, very meaningful connection with what Vincent was talking about, but let me not attempt to make that up as I go. Okay, so, so these are some kind of, these representations, are, as I said, are some kind of building blocks, but these are not irreducible representations. And maybe more traditionally, people would care about irreducible representations. And so um, Bartle and Livney computed the endomorphism algebras of these compact inductions and showed that these are just polynomial rings in one variable, P, where T is some kind of analog perhaps of, of the UP operator. And if you quotient these things out by kind of specializing T at some value, maybe lambda and FP bar, uh, this is usually uh, irreducible. I'm not going to run through exactly when it isn't. isn't. If lambda is non-zero, you get some something that's actually isomorphic to a a sort of principal series and an induction from the of a character from the Brel. And those are irreducible except when you have the trivial and Steinberg representations, a lot like in Schumann's talk. And when lambda is zero, you get the so-called uh, super singular representations. There's some kind of mod P analog of being super cuspidor. And these have, were proved to be irreducible by Christoph Broy. And so we can kind of immediately so th this gives us some list of all the irreducible representations. So these are, uh, these give all the irreducible uh, smooth G reps and characteristic P. And using the knowledge here, we can say what they're mapped to by this functor, because you, you just apply the functor to kind of C and sigma mapping by t minus lambda to this compact induction. And well, you now have a line bundle, this t minus lambda, um, kind of unsurprising, this capital T is strongly related to the small t. And so what you end up with getting is you get some kind of rank one sheaf on uh, the locus, the kind of uh, t equals lambda locus. So if you like, you, you kind of have this map and you restrict it just to the one component x of sigma and you, sorry, you, you uh, maybe I should just have this whole map and you, yeah, I shouldn't restrict it to one component. You have this map and you look at the pre-image of, of t and you have something that's rank one and supported on that. So if t is, Zero, you're just getting a skyscraper sheaf, zero infinity here. And otherwise you're getting something that's supported sort of on the locus of representations that have the correct semi-simplification. So it's kind of extensions of characters in both directions. That's maybe something you kind of might have guessed. And then the kind of, and you can check that this is compatible with the various kind of isomorphisms of some of these rep between some of these representations on each side. So there's not a contradiction. And if you look at the trivial on Steinberg, you get a picture that's exactly like in Schumann's talk. The Steinberg is going to some line bundle on the, the kind of sim p minus one component here, and the trivial is going to a different line bundle shifted to degree minus one. Okay, but I want to keep going because I do want to say something about QP squared. And I'm kind of just kind of trust that if I turn the pages enough, I'm going to get to the last couple of things I want to say. So I want to spend sort of two or three minutes talking about uh, the adjoint to the functor A, and then whatever time remains, talking about GL2QP squared.
So just by, by the adjoint functor theorem, this, this functor A has a, uh, a right adjoint going back from sheaves on the stack to representations. So this, I should, should just perhaps remark, this, this fully faithful functor is really very far from being an equivalence. And so the adjoint functor is not just going to give us back what we started with. Uh, so that's kind of B, maybe it should be some kind of Gothic B, this is a disaster. So let's not worry too much about that, but um, it's going to go from, or maybe it's better to say, to start with that it goes from uh, the incoherent sheaves to smooth representations, although in fact it's going to restrict to um, the bounded coherent going back to the finitely presented. And it's, uh, I mean, if you like, it exists by the adjunct functor theorem, but it's literally got a description. Since, uh, since A was given by tensoring without infinity, B is given by some Hom out of, uh, out of that infinity. So maybe Hom's in some category of pro sheaves from L infinity to F. And so this, because L infinity has a G action, this gives me something that goes back from sheaves to representations of G. And I just want to tell you a couple of examples of what it does, because this kind of connects to sort of more traditional approaches to pilot Langlands. So if I have a mod P represent, Sorry, did I? Oh, bounded. Is this what I was calling it before? Whatever. Um, because let me see if I've got a succinct statement. I mean, basically, some general uh, property of. Um, of continuous functors reflecting compact objects, but let me see if I've actually got a lemma. So if you have a co-limit pr preserving fully faithful functor that preserves compact objects, then it reflects them. So the, the image is compactive and only if. Uh, you're right, I think. Let me let me not claim that. Sorry. What? Yeah, that's not what the theorem I just claimed says. So let me just have this restriction. What is true is that having this right adjoint means that the original functor, if I put something in and get something which lands in here, then the thing to start with was finally presented. Yeah, so that's just the general. Yes, exactly. That's just that's the property I want to use. And you're right. This This was not a correct claim. Thanks. Yes, and in fact, what what is also correct is I'm going to give you an example for GL2QP squared that contradicts what I wrote. So, <laughs> thanks. Sorry, uh, that will teach me to deviate from my notes again. Uh, so, if I have one of these things with, and I'm always going to assume the determinant is the correct one, uh, this corresponds to a point. Uh, of the stack. Um, x. And then what I can do is I can just from this, I can just form kind of a skyscraper type sheaf. So I'm just going to have, um, and maybe I'm just calling this x. And then I just want to consider the functor b applied to the push forward of, um, of the structure sheaf here, if you like. Slightly ludicrous notation. So this is giving me something, some way in, in theory of going back from gal representations to representations. It may or may not be a very meaningful thing to do, but let me just give you kind of a couple of examples of what this actually does. Um, let's do that over here. Uh, 
Okay, so um, so I take a uh, if rho bar is a sum of two characters, chi one plus chi two, then this gets mapped. Sorry, this gets mapped to a sum of uh, sort of two principal series. Uh, as long as maybe I should assume that the ratio of these is not the trivial or more piece of atomic characters. Uh, and these are both uh, the pi i irreducible principal series representations. And if, if rho bar is irreducible, it gets mapped to uh, a super singular irreducible. And this is exactly what you would expect. This is exactly what the mod p semi simple uh, Langan's correspondence of, uh, I guess, of Broy does. Uh, if you put an extension in, you get something over here, you get some kind of extension as well. So this, this kind of gives you some way of, of going from the Gower side back to representations, which agrees with sort of traditional things. Um, the image of this, this thing is really not in the image of the functor exactly, yeah. And so if you do this twice, you don't get back. So it's an exercise to see that if you then put this in, um, I mean, for example, in this case, what you get back is something that's supported on this whole locus where the extension's in each direction. Yeah, so I certainly don't claim that this is some way of writing down a bijection or anything like this between, but it is a thing that that has some meaning, which I'll, I'll say something more about in the next five minutes. Um, because I think I should now do what I've been saying from the start and now just say something about uh, the case of EGL2QP squared. So I'm going to say very little, but just to say kind of, kind of, the analogs of kind of, well, smooth G, the finitely presented things, uh, X and so on, these are all fine. And I mean, the dimension of X is twice as big, for example. Um, you still have components uh, X of sigma. So you still have the classification of the irreducible components in the same way. And you still have the, in the kind of generic sigma case, you still have isomorphisms to, um, well, now not A2 minus zero. You get two copies of this. Kind of, this is kind of product of two copies mod sort of two copies of GM. And in fact, this, Everything I'm saying goes over to QP to the F and you would have F copies. Uh, the only difference is that the GM action now has some kind of twisting. So it, it doesn't just act on each copy individually. But again, this is just what Fondified theory gives you. You can kind of describe lots of things explicitly. So we don't have, have a candidate for A. So we don't have any kind of functor. And similarly, we don't have L infinity, but we expect that it exists. So if we imagine it exists, imagine the theorem is still true, then you can kind of ask what kind of deductions you could make from the, the theorem. Um, so again, you can do some things. And uh, let me maybe just leave that up there. So the first major difference is like in the kind of geometry is that these components have the same kind of description, but before I was just gluing along reducible and irreducible loci, but now the kind of dimension has doubled and now I have the kind of irreducible points, for example, are sort of co-dimension two rather than co-dimension one. And it turns out that there are kind of interesting intersections in co-dimension one as well. So along sort of the T equals zero locus in one of these components. And what that means is that 
the components are kind of glued together in complicated ways. And for example, the sort of course moduli space just collapses. So that's kind of kind of complicated thing, but it's not such a problem for describing things. It's still the case that you expect this to be uh, a self-dual, the only self-dual line bundle on X of sigma. And so you can still say similar things for what you expect to happen uh, for these quotients. But now the problem is that if, if lambda is non-zero, then again, you just have a description in terms of principal series. But the compact inductions of sigma mod t, this is no longer irreducible. In fact, it has infinite length. And similarly, if pi is uh, an irreducible quotient to this, so it's uh, an irreducible uh, super singular, uh, then Benjamin Schren showed that, uh, that pi is never finitely presented. So by the kind of correct version of what I was attempting to say about compact objects, that means that uh, A of pi is not coherent. You can still see uh, that the amplitude of this function should still be minus one and zero, basically, because you can show that everything has a two-step resolution by compact inductions. So the answer is not that it's some unbounded thing. It should still be something bounded. And what you can show, and I'm, I'll just kind of say something, is that um, that for these for these super singular pies, a of pi uh, will still have a coherent. I mean, and again, these statements since this functor a is not known to exist, this is you have to attach them, kind of suspend your disbelief. But it still has a co coherent h zero, and that's just because these all admit subjections from these compact inductions, and so they all admit subjections from line bundles. Um, but the H minus one has to be some quasi-coherent thing, not coherent. And we don't know anything about it. On the other hand, you can still do the same construction uh, as up there. Maybe I'll just say this. You can still, if you have an irreducible, for example, uh, representation of GQP squared, you could still do this, this looking at, uh, this sheaf, which isn't in the image, and applying the, the adjoint functor and seeing what you get. And what, um, what you expect to get, and if you believe that this thing exists and is compatible with cohomology of varieties, you can use um, the recent results about uh, gelfan kirillov dimension of uh, Broy, Herzig, Mora, Schren, who, in some order, Hopefully that's the correct orders. You can you can use their results to see that you really have to get some actual irreducible super singular pi that you've kind of associated to your row bar. So given an irreducible mod p representation of GQP squared, you do this recipe and you will get, I believe, uh, a uniquely distinguished um, representation of the kind that Brian Pascunas constructed a long time ago. On the other hand, they constructed sort of infinite families of these things. And if you apply this functor A to any of the other ones, you can show that you necessarily get something where the H0 is just zero. Again, if you just kind of think through how these things work. So this gives this picture gives you some kind of explanation of these phenomena that Brian Pascunas found. But over time, and it's lunchtime, so I'll stop. <laughs>